This is Drumageddon, and you're listening to Verbal Shenanigans, rock and roll. But our shenanigans are cheeky and fun. Yeah, I mean, his shenanigans are cruel and tragic. Which makes them not shenanigans at all, really. Evil shenanigans. I swear to God, I'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans. Hello, everybody. We are we are back. We're back in full force, Mike. I, I feel like we're the most full force we've been in a couple months as far as, like, we have interviews in the can. We have episodes planned. I think we're booked we're solid through March at the moment. So we have a lot of... Um, a lot of content coming out. Yep. Um, I can't guarantee any of it is good content, but we have content, and it's going out at some point. <laughs> yeah, we're Vince McManning. We're using force the entire time. We don't care what you think. Oh, Vince McManning. Vince McManning. We dove into that pretty deep last week. Mm-hmm. But like 24 hours after we dove into that, I'm like, we didn't dive in deep enough because so much more came out after our episode that we recorded. Like over, so over the weekend, a whole lot more came out. How do you feel like the guy that we watched and he developed the thing that you know you still watch to this day? How do you feel that he's like dumping on, dumping on girls' heads? You know, like it's one of those that shock at first, and then you. Think about it for two minutes. It's like, yeah, that fits him. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that fits him. And yeah. I, the, the worst—it's not even the worst part. He did it. He's like, continue what you're doing with to my partner. I'm gonna go wash up, and you be ready for me to come back. Yeah, that's I, how intense that guy was. I don't think he's even. I think I brought up last week. I don't think he's gonna Joe Paterno this, where he. It seemed like the shame was so bad that Joe Paterno was just like, "I'm out. <laughs> Goodbye, world. Like, I'm not. I can't deal with this. My family can't deal with this." Whether we don't we don't know the whole Joe Pa story, which is kind of fitting for his ending because he was so loved. I feel like Vince McMahon is just like, eh. <laughs> like I don't f- do. You, do you see him as a depressed man in his house right now? I feel like he's still like, yeah. It's like like he's <laughs> he's still got other people on the phone that he's calling and doing this too. I feel he's frustrated right now because his entire life has been that federation. I mean, when yeah. it, it first came out, he did everything to force his way back into it, and he used the leverage of the stock and all that. Sure. He basically made sure it was sold to somebody that was going to put him in a position where he had control of stuff. So sure. he definitely has a <clears throat> frustrating thing there. The scary thing I would say is when you kind of look at Joe Paterno, when like he left, you knew he wasn't – long for this earth much longer he was like a frail guy and yeah I, I, we've seen a lot of the like coaches that retired late 70s le- early 80s they retire and then like maybe most a year later oh they pass away because there's nothing keeping them going that dude is so jacked like we could be dealing with Vince McMahon 30 years from now <laughs> and have no end in the future after that <laughs> his funeral is going to be an interesting one i'll tell you that at least um but like you'll like pop out of the coffin with the grim reader reaper and just be like i told you i wasn't going far. now where's my company i will give you i will i will send you a six-pack right now if you could find the jerry sandusky joe paterno connection to verbal shenanigans jerry Sand- Oh my! And goodness. ironically, I just found this out today because I was having a conversation with some friends today. Mike, I'm, I'm trying to think. Like I'm thinking of our sports guests. Dilfer didn't go to Penn State. Jacoby no. didn't go to Penn You're gonna State. Have to de- I, I will tell you right now. You got to think of. You're on the wrong avenue. Okay, the so the obvious avenue is the wrong direction. Yes the the sports avenue <laughs> is actually not the avenue to go down. Okay. So it's not Rugby Atlanta, is what you're telling me. <laughs> well, I can't give too many hints, but no, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not <laughs> Rugby Atlanta. <laughs> One of the most popular episodes there mm-hmm. with the Mountain Goat. Um, 
Yeah, I, I do. Would, would you like I, to know? Would you like? Yeah, to know? yeah. I give out the six pack. What is it, Scotty? So today we were. I was talking to some guys, and we we're just talking about like I don't know the conversation of like, um, like serial killers and murders and stuff like that came up, like these things in the news and blah blah blah. Um, and I was talking to him. And I said, I my my buddy was like, we should all. The, he was like, you should have a serial killer on your podcast. I said, well, like jokingly, I said, well. I didn't have a serial killer, but I did have someone that murdered somebody. And he's like, what? I'm like, oh, yeah, I had Clark Fredericks on the podcast. Technically, then, too, we've had on there. Lilo Brancati went to jail for murder. Yeah. But he I, didn't have murder the person, but he went to jail. For now, murder. I don't know who Lilo Brancati is, but Lilo no. Brancato we had on the show. He, oh. Brancati was that weird, his weird stepbrother. But, you know. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in the background. Yeah. Don't take it, don't take it, somebody, please. <laughs> um, so Clark Fredericks, who we had on the show many years ago, and it was one of those interviews, like, listen, we prep for interviews, but there's some guests we go on. We don't prep a single thing for. We just talk to. This is one of those ones where I was, like, texting Mike, like, you know, should we do, like, you know, let's we got to kind of get our head around doing this because we usually bring on artists, musicians, world record holders, goofball, like whatever, rapper, whatever on the show, athletes here and there. We don't bring on murderers too often. Now, I say murderer like he's a terrible guy, but there's a there's a flip of a coin that you could, you know, you have to digest because he was on the podcast. He was. So essentially, he was molested by his scoutmaster for like five, six years when he was younger. And Mike, here's the connection. Okay. If you read it, so today I looked back up uh, Clark Fredericks because I was telling him, like, yeah, this guy was on. And if you read the story, when he committed the murder, the Jerry Sandusky um, like trials were going on, and he was kind of getting off of on a bunch of things. And Clark Fredericks at the time was on like cocaine, like you know, raging, raging out mm -hmm. and something snapped in him where he said, you know, Jerry Sandusky is never going to get his justice. And then like, eventually he saw his scoutmaster or whatever, and, and mm -hmm. something snapped in him and he, he killed the guy. Um, mm -hmm. And if you read the story about Clark Fredericks, if you type him into um, Google, like it's a very interesting story. Cause like a lot of the town was like supporting him like uh, in his trial and, and whatnot. And he ended up doing like five years, but he didn't mm -hmm. get out. And they were like, People were cheering at his like hearing, like when he was talking about what was going on. Well, the uh, when he got arrested with the police, they were basically telling him, "Hey, don't worry, we got this, this, and that yep. on the information." They were pretty much telling him, "We know what you did. We got to bring you in, but we understand and we're behind you." Yeah, still remains one of the. <clears throat> I want to sit there and say it's the best episode we've ever done. You got to go listen to it, but definitely one of the most outside like we'd try to go for outside the box guests normally but yeah. maybe like outside outside than what we normally do so um yeah with the cheese sculptor lady right out yeah, there yeah. with them exactly we'll have people who sculpt cheese we'll have pumpkin carving champions mm -hmm. and then we'll have a murderer on the podcast yeah yeah Sometimes all in the same episode, <laughs> yeah, lazy. especially back in the day. And yeah. <laughs> if some of the interviews we've done lately uh, keep going, we might put them all in one just to get them all out of there. Yeah, uh, we and say we say don't listen to this one. Well, when we say we're going to break the world record for longest podcast, that will be two interviews. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No spoilers, <laughs> but you'll see it coming. So speaking of, I, I thought this was kind of funny. Um we, we it's funny because Mike message we we plan guests. Mike will get guests. I'll get guests, and we kind of fill our calendar up. That's a little peek behind the scenes, or or what I mean is our our department gets them for us. Yeah, yeah, we're we're the head of the department, so we just talk as figureheads and all. Yes. But our our five hundred uh, cast members under us, they do the grunt work. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Mike messaged me. I have blah 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 on the cast for some time in March. And maybe I read it or maybe I just like read through it. I was like, cool. Yeah, I was like, cool on the date or something like that. But it didn't sink in like deep in my brain. Maybe it just put something subliminally. Yeah. Um, so I went like down a wormhole. I was like, you know what? We've never had on the podcast. We've never had a um, 
a dog sled team, like uh, like yeah. someone who's been in the Iditarod, something like that. So I go down a wormhole and I get on the Iditarod, like past champions, people who are racing in it. And it's a good website because it has like 50 people on there and like all their, almost all of their contact information. So I send, I probably rifle off probably 10, 12 emails. Okay. And I, I find, I, I won't reveal who it is for all those big Iditarod fans out there that are on the oh, edge of, the edge of it's their seat. So freaking huge right now, but you got to wait for us. Um, but one that I did like um, involved two people. Okay. Involved two people. And they got back to me and I was like, Mike, I think I got these. Uh, yeah, screw it. Whatever. I think I get these twins or sisters that both work, that have both, that both race in the Iditarod and I'm currently scheduling them. And he goes, <laughs> dude, or, or he's like, the guy that I sent you the other day is like a 10 time I did or odd champion. I'm like, Oh crap. Now in the last two days, I have responses from like Alaskan Husky.com. Uh, like, you know, like blah, blah, blah. Kennel in, in Alaska. But the funny story is, <laughs> um, there's, there's one place. Hold on. I got, I got to bring it on because it's really funny. Um, the, yeah, we, we kind of went at, at, at the wrong time because we're coming <laughs> near the end of winter, so they're all probably like, dang, I got nothing to do for the next nine months, and then they get that one email. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. So basically, this one guy that I found, um, he, he, I get in touch with him, and I send him our usual spiel, like, we've had these people mm-hmm. on the show, this is what the show is. He says, I'm flattered, but curious. Why you would want to interview the 30 fa- 34th place winner of the 2022 <laughs> Iditarod? <laughs> and then he says, Did D. Snyder put you up to this? I mean, Twisted Sister was my first concert in 84. So I yeah. laugh. I said, We're just always looking for interesting people. He goes, Sounds like it could be fun, but for real, how did you find me? <laughs> so now. <laughs> This mu- professional musher who's like dead last in mm-hmm. dog sledding is now concerned he has like yeah. one of those stalking fans trying to get him onto a podcast. Yeah. So basically, I said I was just on my on the Iditarod page, and apparently, I said on my Iditarod page. So your own, yeah, my my, my personal page. Yeah, ScottyIditarod dot com. Everybody yeah. for yeah. all the yeah. latest mushing news. The Scott Scott Iditarod. It's the hardest race <laughs> in the world. Um, <laughs> I said I went through my I did a red page and went through a bunch of mushers. He said I'm kind of nobody, but I'd be interested. So now I kind of want to bring the nobody on because it's hysterical. <laughs> but um, so now <laughs> you know how guys how we have the gladiators coming out. We have three mm-hmm. of them. We have one more. We'll get to that in a second. Um, <laughs> we might have a. <laughs> <laughs> and I did a rod musher month, musher, musher March, musher right? March. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know how March Madness has so, sixty eight teams. We're gonna have sixty eight of the greatest dog sledders of all time, and then you all tell us who was the greatest interview. See, and this has happened before. This has happened where mm-hmm. I get hyper focused on a thing that I want to mm-hmm. interview somebody, and I'll interview. I mean, I'll email everybody that i can find and then it's radio silence i get one and i'm like yes and then all of a sudden like three or four more come in i'm like oh god oh god like we did that with the show kingdom i was watching um which i actually just found out i was on peacock fantastic show i've been re-watching it Mm. um so it's appropriate also occurred a bit um but i got the director on i was so pumped i'm like i want to talk to this guy about the show and then all of a sudden, I had three act, three separate actors from the show who also responded because I sent out like, you know, I got on a street one, ones. sent out mass emails, but they all came in different. Se- I'm like, well, I guess we're gonna do like a kingdom, um, you know, series here. And Gladiators has happened. There's been a couple of different things like this. Yeah, we had a, a couple of submarine shows, <laughs> if I recall, in a row. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we had a couple of hot air balloons in a row. We had the guy who who was trying to organize a world blimp race followed by a Goodyear blimp pilot. And yes. uh, 
Yeah, the, the first guy was cool. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the second one, it's like, this sounds like it'll be amazing. And yeah. it was very corporate. Like they had part, somebody listening on to us in case we're in the wacky Z morning zoo asking, like, are your the boobs as big jumps. as your blimps or <laughs> something like that? <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's funny because now we've been on this little streak here in, in uh, 2024 and we're getting good interviews but the interviews are long-winded people and i think mm-hmm. our audience will understand that in the next couple weeks not that they're bad but they are long uh winded folk now because of this um we 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 have we do have one more gladiator on and we do have a funny story about that we're gonna hold that mm-hmm. now if you are a follower if you have listened me and mike have a little competition where we've been playing games um leading up to someone's going to sing the national anthem for real um and we do have one last event now i'm going to be dead honest the last two podcasts we were going to get into these events possibly but they went for so long we've been ending at like 11 30 12 o'clock at night and it's just like we're not doing any creative thing and then the week goes by and we're like okay so unfortunately, we are going to have to postpone. I know all you guys were on bated breath waiting for me or Mike to sing the national anthem, but uh, we're going to have to postpone it at least one more week, Mike. Our competition, our last game is not completely uh, radio ready, if you will. It's not ready for the big yeah. time. Yeah, I, I, I've still been petitioning for us to have like a guest host to run this game. I still think that's the best I am right there. I'm kind of glad... Uh, as you may have tell, my voice is a little off. I totally lost my voice like two days ago. So like, this is the best I've been able to talk in quite a while. And yeah, insert your joke there, Scotty. It's still uh, loud. Well, well, no, I mean, like, I, I, I mean, the funny, like, I had like no voice, but I could still like scream with the best of them when like the dogs are running out of the yard or something uh-huh. like that. It's, it's <laughs> back here, but like. Amplified by ten thousand because uh-huh. that's just how I roll. But uh, this this is why your your voice is gone because it was you were saving it and then you blew it out with your big old. Yell. Oh yeah! If you just monitored it a little bit, it would have been back. Well, it's got to be honest. Over the weekend, I traveled down to Sydney and I uh-huh. went to their opera house and I was just belting opera all day long and like. There were tears, there were standing oh, ovations. Uh, Jonathan Antoine heard my music, and he temporarily retired. He's like, I, I can never compete with that, and I had to coax him back in. I'm like, no, think of the Antoines, okay? Think of the fans. Stop this it. Is, this is great that you're running with this, because don't think the next time that we have John on, we won't have an uh, opera off. Oh. Well, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> my my schedule's busy, so I can't guarantee I'm oh, available yeah. that Thursday, Scott. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> I, I'm a very busy man. I mean, as you saw, I went to Sydney, so you never know where I could be traveling next. So. This, this sounds like you're backing out live on the air. Uh, uh, the, Scott. If You wouldn't Scott, do an opera Scott, off with John Antoine? I, I, I do pretty much anything on the show, okay? <laughs> what, what are we talking about? I we talked have about being left. stinky in the gym a, a month ago. So. I was thinking about this the other day. We have nothing left. There's no dignity left in this show. Right. We have we have sold our souls to, to the podcast as far as uh, yep. uh, telling pretty much everything. I can't think of too many stories that I, I have not told that are in which when it comes to like some kind of game or something that we're trying to like, you know, shock each other about ourselves it gets really hard because i can't remember what i've said over the last 11 years i was shocked i came up with so much and like the one you said oh you told me the story before i'm like i don't even remember yeah uh, the yeah. one where i was like climbing into the window of a place that they uh <laughs> changed the locks on me but uh i digress <laughs> um so before we get to our guest um i had an interesting thought today so last week um my favorite soccer team liverpool who i followed very closely for a lot of years in fact it's probably the closest sport i follow at this point which is crazy Mm. um their head coach um he he's leaving at the end of the season okay um and he's beloved by all the fans he's made them competitive he's won every trophy once so jürgen klopp is retiring um and all my friends know that I love Jurgen Klopp. My my German friend, Jurgen Klopp is obviously German, Mike, in case you 
you needed clarification. Um, I was about to ask. Yeah. Yes. So they actually bought me because I officiated their wedding. They gave me a cutting board that says Jurgen Chop, and it's his face on the cutting board. Um, mm. This is really funny. But anyway, so he's retiring. It, it was like a blow. And I was like in mourning for like two days. Like, I can't believe this. Like, I can't believe he's leaving. Like, the fans just love him. You know, like we all love him because he's great. He's the players love him. He, he He's always riling up the crowd. It's, long story short, people love him. Um, but I, I had a thought like, this might be the final person in my sports watching career that I felt like a, like a, boyhood connection to like when mm. they were like more than a person to me like you know what i mean like oh my yeah. god like that like if he walked in if there was a dream guest if we made that list again like dream guest on the pod he'd probably be like number one or two um, yeah but i got a musher that week so we're at the cancel sorry jurgen we got a lot of mushers to get through what's yeah. your availability in may <laughs> this you know? dude was 27th one time yeah uh, the 34th guy is saying like <laughs> what are we gonna talk about um <laughs> so my question to you um it's kind of a conversation is like there, there's a point as you get older, right, where sports become like a little weird, right? Where you're kind of mm. like, oh my God, I'm as old as them. Then a couple of years go by, I'm older than these people. And then you get to an age where there's no one my age that plays these sports. Like, I'm basically dealing with like Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers, who are like the last of the football players. Well, that, dude, look uh, at me. I'm, uh, I'm 47, so I'm Bartolo Colon level right now. <laughs> I do consider you the Bartolo Cologne of the podcast. Of the podcast. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Big sexy. So so my question to you is like, when's the last, like, do you still feel and that same connection that you had, like, as a kid growing up with sports? Or when was the last, like, person you really, like, I don't know, your heart was in it. There was something different than just watching the game you had a connection to. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking of, like, sporting time like it's still i i I'm still passionate about sports but i can sure. definitely tell it is not the same as it used to be you know a 12 year old mike football's on i'm watching the one o'clock game i'm watching the four o'clock game i'm watching the seven o'clock game i'm watching monday night oh snap there's thursday night gonna get that there's no such thing as a missed game there's no such thing as i'm going out during this time now it's like even when my teams are good, I'll just if I'm lucky, I'll remember. Oh, let me check the app or something like that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> last kind of emotion kind I'm of thing, like or a player or somebody you were connected to, where like uh, you really cared. I mean, I definitely know when uh, Schmidt retired. Mike Schmidt, that really got to me. Like, See, but even that, right? That's like. We're going back pretty yeah. far now, you know? Yeah, and I was pretty young then when he was crying, talking about some kid with two bad knees playing third base, going to Hall of Fame. Did, Recently. Did, did you think he was talking about you? You were like, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, I naturally thought because he said going to the Hall of Fame. I'm like, well, that's me regardless. Yeah. I mean, uh, I haven't played, and I know I'm getting a plaque in there. Well, but... like, even, like, like, let's take a – we'll get back to your point in just one second. But, like, even let's take – um. I guess that was about 10 years ago or eight years ago, nine years ago, where we were watching a football game and like you were watching commanders and screaming about, I think it was Kirk cousins at the time. Right. Probably cousins. You were like, you were like let's go. Let, you know, we were at a bar, like hanging out and you were like, Dang! Oh. yeah, Dang! yeah. Exactly. Dang! I mean, when Do you still have those emotions, because I... I'm finding myself other than that damn little Liverpool, so not they're not little Liverpool soccer yeah. team. My emotions are dying in sports, and it's kind of sad. If my team is getting close to possibly winning it, it you know, I will go back to the passion. Like when the Phillies lost the World Series last year, that there was a lot of pain there. In fact, I'll I'll I admit that. Uh, I'll admit I didn't watch that final game that they lost. I knew go every sign was they weren't going to turn this around and I literally wasn't watching. I was um, like, I remember me and my wife were talking to our friend in New Jersey. We're just chatting. He's like, you ain't watching the game. I'm like, 
I, if I look on the app and say we lost the World Series, okay, I can live with it. Wow. If I watch it on TV, I'm going to get into, I don't want to say like a bad, bad spot, but I'm going to be dwelling on that for like a week. You're not going to like Clark Frederick's situation though, right? No, no, no. Okay. I, I, okay. It, it's just going to be like, you know, you don't get enough sleep. It's like, and the Phillies lost. And the Phillies lost. And like, it will take a very long time to get back into wow. a regular mood. Okay. So, I mean, other than that, I mean, most of my teams haven't even come close. I mean, hell, the Flyers started looking good. What happens? Our goalie, Vince McMahon, apparently. So, <laughs> I mean, um, he's up on sexual. Uh, yeah, charges right. of some sorts. Uh, right. I would say, like the last player, though, I, I felt it a little when we traded away Chase Utley. Chase Utley, the you, Dodgers. You want to have a catch with him? Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I know the joke with Mac and all that. I mean, sure. but he was like the last. Yeah, the, he was like, yeah, that's our blue collar. No, I get Philly's it. kind of player. We just love him. I mean, we win the World Series, and he's cursing on the mic, and the whole stadium is just. Rocking, yeah, yeah. that announcement. It, he he was pure Luke Collar. I mean, even as much as we love the other players, Jimmy went okay. We miss him, but he was another player. Brian Howard never came back to form. Okay, he was another player. Chase went. We're like, ah, oh. yeah. he didn't even get like a last game because yeah. they were they couldn't. Uh, they were trying to finalize the trade. And they literally said, well, we can't put them on the field because we're finalizing the field. So we didn't get that whole, like, maybe, like, go out and uh, pinch run, and then after one out, have somebody pull them out again so we can give them a standing ovation. So we never had that real goodbye for him. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I, when I had this conversation that I, I was just saying, like, um, the last person I can remember connecting to and, like, being really – into was was David Wright for the Mets, which is the same mm. era as Utley, Rollins, Howard. He was the last guy that I was like, he seems like a good guy, that the clean cut kid who grew up with the Mets. He was a Mets fan, you know, like he tore it up when he was younger, got injured, and then his ending was just sad, like every other athlete's ending. It's just sad. guy. They gave him one last game, and like he had to stretch his like spine for like a day and a half to like get on the field. I remember um, that. <laughs> yeah, spinal stenosis. And but other than that, it, it it's funny that you said like when they become go really good, you get really back into it again. But I think that comes with we we've earned fanhood from our teams, right? We've mm -hmm. like it, I'm going to the Devils outdoor game in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be all fired up. They're playing the nice. Flyers. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be fired up. But like the ebbs and flows of a boring season, I'm not fired up like during the no, you know, yeah, no. They like when you're a kid, like you catch a hundred that hundred sixty two, a oh, hundred plus. Of the 95 Devils, I could I could name every player on that team and probably go back into some of the stats they had if I really looked into it. I remember, like, at one time watching Philly games, I was always having a piece of paper, and I was keeping the box score of the entire game. And if they won the game, I hung it on the wall. Wow. And they lost the game, I just ripped it up and threw it away. <laughs> Did you know? So so in your room, the Phillies were undefeated. It was amazing. <laughs> well, no, I knew. I wasn't that drastic with stuff. I knew there was a lot more papers in the garbage than hanging on the wall. But it was just, like, cool. And then you'd, like, go back, and I would, I would have them all by different teams. And I was like, oh, all right, let me look at all the Atlanta wins. Let me look Did at all you, the... Uh... Were you able to properly score a game, like with everything, like backwards K's and all that stuff? I, I was pretty decent. I don't think I knew the backwards K versus the forward K yeah, thing, like but I could slash and everything in the book. Yeah, I could do decent with that. Yeah, but it it is funny, like like with this guy retiring. I know it sounds weird to people who don't watch soccer. This, this is like I look at all my teams, the landscape of all my teams right now, and I'm like, meh. You know, like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Like the Giants, like I'll really be passionate about them when they're good. Like, but do I love Saquon Barkley? Mm -hmm. No, like whatever. He's he's a good running back. You know, I like him. Uh, I, I don't think I'm getting a Dan Quinn uh, tattoo anytime soon. 
<laughs> you should. That should be one of the one of the competitions <laughs> we have. Um, Wait, what? That coach for three years. I was like eighteen and forty nine. <laughs> yep, tramp stamp. But it, I get it. Like, like people probably felt that way with Brady going or, or some of. But when like when you get older, it, it becomes a weird thing. Now, like my dad was never into sports, which was always weird. Like growing up, like I was, I was into sports. He wasn't. Mm. But my grandma was into hockey, and that's how I became so in love with hockey because I would go with my. So I always wonder if like the real deep sports connection has to come from. Does it have to come from early, from younger years, or can you just dive into something like midway, like 30, 40 years old, and be like, I'm so into it. This is my team. It feels disingenuous to me. I mean, about the closest I can say for myself is being a NASCAR fan. I did not start watching NASCAR until my 20s. Okay. Like my brother was a big NASCAR fan. That was the usual, oh, he's running in circles. Ha ha. And I watched a couple of races, and I got into it. So it is possible. I, I th- like. I feel like NASCAR kind of lends itself okay to that because you're like rooting for mm. a guy, right? Like not a mm-hmm. city, not a hometown team you grew up with, not a a group of guys. So like, yeah, I I feel like F1 NASCAR. You're like, okay, I like this guy, which is okay. I think because you're just picking a person out of the field of. Whatever. Or a manufacturer like Ford or something. I, I root for Fords. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's a, that seems a little bit more acceptable. It just be weird. Like my example is that I don't have a basketball team anymore, right? I've told the story. Mm-hmm. Man, the Sonics left. I never followed the Thunder. The Sonics come back. That could pique my interest a little bit, and I bet you it would end mm-hmm. just me following them for one year. And then they'd suck, and I'd be like, eh. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. eh, whatever. Like, there's no Sean Kemp coming along that's going to make me oh. want to watch all of the things that he does. You don't think they can sell out an arena? They say for one night only, Sean Kemp is coming off the bench at like 50 years old, and we cocaine him up. Dude, I'm I'm looking into tickets from Jersey to Seattle. I'm <laughs> I'm making plans. I, I I'm dusting off the uh, the Sonics jerseys. Yeah. But there's no new player that's going to excite me, and I think that that's a sad part of getting older. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a different time. Now they're all on – we used to have, like, our local sports networks. Now they're all going away. Mm. So, like, who who's like, oh, let me fire up the Apple TV to watch this baseball game or something sure. like that. And it's, it's just a different time. I mean, when we were growing up, we had less options. Sports was the easiest thing to get into. We usually had friends or family into it, so it just automatically happens. Now it's so spread out and different options. Uh, there's yeah. times I've seen more people wearing MLS uh, stuff around the city than any kind of Braves or Falcon stuff. So. Yeah. Um, before we get to our guest, Super Bowl prediction that's coming out this Monday. What do you got? Score, well, uh, and, score and team. Uh, for first off, if I recall from our prediction, we were both right with San Francisco, and we were okay. both wrong with the AFC. If I recall, I think I had the Bengals. If I you had the Bengals, I had the Dolphins. So, all right, uh, I'm going to say Chiefs 27, 49ers 24. Um, both teams are pretty even. I and when they're even, I go to who's the better quarterback and. I mean, Mahomes, he, he's been starting for six years. He's been in six championship games. So, I mean, yeah. it's insane what we're looking at. Uh, I mean, it's great what Brock Purdy's doing, but in the end, if it game's on the line and Mahomes got the ball, I'm just saying give him the trophy. I am um, very much in agree. Uh, agreement. Is, is agreement a word? Yeah. That, uh, that, that sounds like a Burlu word. It does sound Burlu-y. That's why I stopped yeah. myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Scott, I, I had an agreement with my parents today. <laughs> but uh, I'm definitely going Chiefs. Um, I think they've been there. They're battle-tested, and they seem to be getting better and better and better every week where they're just making great offenses look terrible. Um, so for once, like we'll focus on the Mahomes side of the ball, but the defense seems to be just killing it right now. Um, so I definitely have the Chiefs winning. They're battle-tested. 
Again, same thought. Purdy, you know, he's a good quarterback. Is he ready to win the Super Bowl against <clears throat> Reed and the boys? I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will go – I think – I'm gonna go a little bit bigger of a gap. I'm gonna go uh, Chiefs. I'm gonna go Chiefs. I think it's gonna be a lower scoring affair. I'm gonna go Chiefs 24 17. 24 okay. 17. So one other thing, over or under, I'm gonna put the number at seven and a half times they show Taylor Swift during the game. Um. I'll go over. Um, doesn't bother me at all. I don't get the hate. Um, let, let's get into that conversation after we get to our guest. But um, right. so we got to get to guest time here because that's what we do on the show. We do stupid banter, and then we also bring on a guest. So if it's your first time tuning in, thanks for joining us. Um, but if you are a fan of um, Drumageddon, Drumageddon. Um, he has a, a very big social media following. He has um, toured all over the place, kind of doing what he calls like a cyborg drummer. He he plays live drums. He mixes things. He he recently just put out a remix with the Beatles, a small band called the Beatles. They're up and coming from no, you know, from Liverpool. Good time. Oh, yeah. oh have I heard anything of theirs? No, they got some talent though. They got some talent. Okay. They they could be big but uh drum again and also a jersey guy which is pretty cool so uh without further ado here's our interview with drum again there we go there he is hey how's it going how are you awesome man awesome 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 mm-hmm. that's mike i'm scott welcome welcome to the mm-hmm. show man thanks for giving us a couple minutes of your time could be dope you know, yeah. nice you got a nice setup there. It's Ooh. not bad, man. <laughs> <laughs> where where are we calling you at today? Where where this are you? This is my at? studio. I'm actually at the studio right now. I got all the uh, this is a 35 piece drum set behind me. Crazy. <laughs> what what uh, state? What state are you in? Or? So I live in New York City in the West Village, okay. um, but the studio is out in Jersey. So you know, we're in Jersey. I'm in Jersey too. Oh, what part? What part are you in? I'm in Denville. Oh, uh, dude, I grew up in Rockway. I went to Knowles. <laughs> No. Oh, wow. yeah, I used man. to live. I used to live in Rockway. I grew up in Woodbridge, but uh, made my way up here, and now I'm in uh, Indian Lake over here in Denville. So badass. Yeah, nice, funny. Man. I, I used to live in Flanders. In yeah, Flanders is dope too, man. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. So yeah, this place is in Maplewood, so I'm a little closer east to the city now, and everything. Yeah, yeah. So. but yeah. I'm right next to the airport, mm. so awesome. nice and easy. So I guess I guess the best way to, to start with you is now that we know I kind of know where you're from and whatnot. What were you a were you a uh, like a music theater type of kid growing up? Were you always into music, or was this something you found later on? Oh man, I started when I was six or seven, so okay. I just played the drums. Right. Everything about the drums was the best for me. It was insane. I was like, let me. Uh, I remember the first time I was in what is it like fourth grade in band conductor guys up there, you know, trying to keep the tempo slow and everything. I'm playing the snare drum, which is the loudest thing in the entire orchestra. Mm-hmm. And I just started to go. Let me see how fast this guy can go, you know. And the entire orchestra speeds up, speeds up. By the end, he's like going like this. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to do this now. This is really dope, you know. <laughs> Like what kind of equipment did you have home? Did you have that great uncle who got you the drum kit that your parents hated, or did it take you a while to get something at the home set up? Uh, it took me a while. I mean, I started out on like little concert snare, and then you know learned on the sticks and pads and that whole thing. And then it was, I think, around thirteen is when I finally got that first drum set. It was uh, I was doing jazz band with my a really good friend of mine who was also a drummer and we both wanted to get drum sets you know i got my drum set from an attic in jersey somewhere which is really funny and then uh and then he his dad is like okay here's the deal if you don't play wipe out you know if you don't play mm-hmm. that wipe out drum solo perfectly you can't get a drum set you know for my friend tommy and he's like crap so he and i just practiced and practiced and practiced until he got it and then he finally got the drum set so we could both be in bands i was playing like a uh, pearl jam grunge and he was playing nirvana grunge 
Yeah. And then, you know, we did nice. talent shows and all that stuff and then local sure. bands. And then I worked my way up and eventually got to the New York scene and went completely nuts, you know? So, <laughs> okay. So you, you've, you've been involved with drums your, your whole life though. So that's, yeah. that's kind of absolutely right. now. Now, did you, did you dabble into other instruments? Now we'll get into like what you do now in, in, in a little bit, but did you dabble in guitars or singing or anything, or has it always just been, I'm a drummer? I mean, I played I played a little bit of piano, a little bit of guitar, a little bit of bass, just a tiny, tiny bit. Um, mostly it was frowned upon for, you know, musicians to not play the instrument that they were supposed to, you know. Sure. When I went to the music mm-hmm. shop, you know, and I got that $150 guitar, you know, yep. the the head of the drum department's like, oh, man, here he goes again. Uh, yep. You know, this kid, you know. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but no, I mean, I just had a... I needed to be able to produce. I needed to be able to songwrite. Um, I always sang, you know, in choirs and stuff like that. I I didn't really start singing lead until later on. Um, and then songwriting and everything happened in, I would say, high school. And then I went to college for music. But um, funny thing is, you know, when I went to college, I was still a drummer up to what is it, senior year of high school. And, you know, I never learned notes and I never learned chords. So all I knew was rhythm and all that yeah, stuff. Mm. So, so I literally between high school um, and college, the very first I was in, you know, music school, Drew University, you know, um, studying music theory, that high school in between the um, summer of senior year and freshman year of college, I sat down and I had to learn what notes were, what chords were. I'm like, how is a C, a note and a chord? It's like, shut up and learn, kid. You know, yeah, <laughs> taking yeah. private, mm-hmm. you know, it, private it, lessons and everything. <laughs> you know, I, I played bass in bands for like 15 years. Never knew a, you know, I knew the the four strings, what the, what note those were, but I never. It was always, I don't know, patterns and you know, just listening by ear and following along and um, so like that. Just just the idea of like being. Okay, this is like going breaking it all the way back down would be like torturous for me. But I've always thought about that, like going back and being like, okay, let's learn this properly, quote unquote. Oh, no, it was a pain in the ass. So (laughs) that whole freshman, sophomore year of college, I was like learning Bach and then I was learning jazz theory and like the really hard stuff. And I'm like, ah, crap, man. But it eventually I got arranging, I got composing, I've got um, songwriting and lyric writing and everything that I started to assimilate. And, you know, just being a drummer who's played literally everything with everyone at this point, you know, every style of music, um, I've actually learned tens of thousands of songs now. And those songs are deeply ingrained in my brain. I've, you know, deconstructed a lot of those songs. And now I could actually write songs that are hits in the pop and EDM thing, which is basically what I do is drumageddon, you know, basically drumming and DJing at the same time on crazy drums behind me you know <laughs> now on your as i looked you up you're listed as a cyborg drummer yep. and uh i'm not really sure what that is i tried to google it and i kept on getting the story of some kid with a cybernetic arm and you got both your arms so i know you're not him <laughs> no nah, so, man that's just how good that tech is man you can't yeah. tell you can't tell <laughs> Dude, it's from the waist down. That's all. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So I could, I could use some cybernetics down there too. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, what happened is, so I got the call. Like this had to be, I don't know what year this was, but I got called to play with a major label artist on Warner Brothers. You know, he was a double platinum artist. He had um, a hit out on the radio on Z100 and was playing like a lot of the big festivals. And he was a hip hop, white hip hop guy, kind of like Macklemore who switched over to kind of dance pop, you know, with some EDM kind of stuff in it. And, you know, when he called me, the the management is like, hey, so we need a guy. Um, can you be a cyborg drummer for us? I'm like, absolutely. What the hell is that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you know, OK, I need someone to basically run tracks, um, sing back up, lead the band, um, you know, basically DJ and drum at the same time. And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, and oh, you just electronics and we'll send you all the files with all the drum sounds and then stems and all that. I'm like, cool, cool, cool. I get off the phone. It's one week before the first rehearsal. And I'm like, crap. Up to this point, I was only doing acoustic drums, right? Mm-hmm. I always wanted yeah. to get electronics and all that stuff and the cyborg aspect of it. Um, so I ran to Guitar Center 
and I bought all this stuff. I'm trying to plug it in, watching YouTube tutorials and all that stuff. And what happened is I didn't sleep for an entire week. And by mm-hmm. the first rehearsal I got through, second rehearsal was was solid. And then the first um, gig was a warm-up gig at Manhattanville College. You know, for college kids, it was great. Second gig, opening for Bon Jovi. <laughs> Not shabby. Not shabby. That's a decent yeah. jump. That's a decent it was jump. All right. Yeah, it was yeah. all right. <laughs> like in that week where you were like petrified, was it like excited enthusiasm? Like explain how you're going through it. Are oh. you just angst all the way? Oh, God, no. I was like, is this even going to work? I don't even have to turn this crap on. I, you know, <laughs> I was like, I hope yeah. this stuff works. Another time that it happened, uh, that energy of crazy stuff happened was um, I actually music directed a K-pop crew called 88 Rising. And they have like um, Rich Brian, Joji, all these, you know, it's like a K-pop collective of people. I mean, it's K-pop, J-pop, C-pop, like all the Asian like you know, k-pop pop. avengers yeah. exactly it yeah. really is it's, it's you know the wu-tang the yeah. wu-tang k-pop Got it. you know what yep. i mean uh they call me and the funny part is a buddy of mine was supposed to music direct them he got a last minute call and he's like dude can you just jump on this gig i'm like yeah sure what is it so oh, k-pop whatever they're literally flying from la to new york they're in the air and they're emailing me on the plane they're going all right so we need someone to you know drum dj music direct and then you have to actually live tune their vocal and we're we're landing in like three hours and we're going wow. directly to SIR studios, the uh, rehearsal studio in New York. And then the next day we're on TRL live and I'm like MTV. I'm now, like, are, are you <laughs> just like, oh, my God, I'm so underqualified for this and just like All no, right, that, one, awful. Yeah. that one was like, OK, so up to this point now, at this point, I've been, you know, music directing, I've been producing. So I have all the sounds I, you know, I've done electronic stuff. I've done, you know, regular, regular audio stuff. I've done everything. But I only have a plug in that works when you bounce it down, when you export it not mm-hmm. in live real time. So right. literally I get off the phone, well, you know, get off the uh, the email, I'm like, crap. I said, yeah, I call my friends, no one's around to bring a live, you know, auto-tune rig. Like, all right, so now what? I go on a website of uh, one of the plug-in companies. <laughs> I literally download it just in time to get in the car. Uh, I was out in Jersey at that point, you know, coming, you know, with my gear, I had to get all my, my gear throw it in the car. I'm in tunnel traffic in Lincoln Tunnel, and I'm sitting there learning how to use the plugin on the way in on YouTube. Yeah, and then I show up, I'm like, this better work. I'm putting the plugs in, <laughs> and it worked. Uh, one guy actually had no auto-tune. The other two guys had auto-tune, but they wanted so much auto-tune. I was like, I hope it doesn't fry my system. But, you know, it's like that post Maloney, hip hop sure. Drake, Kanye mm-hmm. mumble rappy thing. I was like, all right, so it went great, you know, MTV TRL. But those are the kinds of gigs that I say yeah to, figure it out later. And yeah, I'm sweating bullets the whole freaking way. It's crazy. <laughs> now, when when um when you when you turn this into where you got to now, where you now where you, like as you, we were setting up for the interview, you're like, yeah, that's my 35 piece kit or whatever. How, how what was the genesis of that? Were you like? I'm just collecting pieces. Did you have an idea in your head? Like, when did this actually turn to to Drumageddon? <laughs> Good question. So the Drumageddon thing started, I was doing, God, I was playing with a bunch of different bands, a bunch of different artists, you know, Sony artists, Warner Brothers, Universal. And uh, I go to my friend's studio in Brooklyn. He bought one entire floor, converted it to a recording studio. I'm recording for a bunch of artists there and everything. One day he's like, oh, you got to see the roof. It looks really cool. I walk up to the roof. You can see like graffiti everywhere, really dope. And then you can see the Manhattan skyline. I'm like, I got to do something up here. And I was like, well, drum solos are just old hat and boring. So screw that. Let me right. let me try to figure yeah. out something that something no one's done. So I called it Drum Again, right? And I played from the floor, the, the ground floor, up the elevator. I had drums through the whole building. And I did like an entire one take eight minute drum solo up an entire broken building that went mini viral. Right. And got me onto like major press, like metal hammer, New York magazine. I'm like, it's just me drumming up a building because it's dumb, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. came out. It came out dope. I called that drum again, and I had another couple videos where I did one in Times Square. I did one in um, 
in Queens at the big globe Unisphere. And between those three, it got me enough buzz. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try to do this drummer DJ thing myself, have my own songs. I'm playing with all these artists, making them, you know, awesome, you know, having hits come out for all these other people. Why not just do it for myself? I'll just cut out the middleman. I'll literally just take, I'll just take um, my own songs, find my, my friends who sing American Idol in the voice, throw them on a track and then put it out and see what happens. I'll promote it myself. And then little by little, each song got bigger and bigger and bigger. Social media blew up during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And now I, I'm mm-hmm. drumageddon the artist, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and I drum and DJ simultaneously in this kit. You know, I'm fully endorsed for many years from playing for all, all the, you know, all the different people. But um, I basically figured out, like, why don't I put a standing side of the drum set, right. seated side, and then drums behind my head where I can jump and scream and all that. I have a mic, I have all my electronics, everything, you know, and then I just set up whatever festival or, you know, nightclub or gig that I play. I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tunes of my own, plus, you know, remixes and original cuts of, you know, other artists and any crowd, I just live read off the floor. And if they dig it, I keep moving. If they don't, I get out of the song quicker than any band can. And I just transition into something else. So, yeah. Mm. You seem to be like a real ball of energy and get really excited. I can tell the passion in your voice. So are you capable of doing like, say, like a gig where they're just like, we just want you to do an easy drum beat, nothing special, or like we got this intimate setting for just like 15 people, keep it calm. Is that something that drum again and ever allows in his life? That's a funny question, man. So I have done a lot of the pop and still do all that stuff. Uh, This is last year. No. Two years ago during the pandemic, I was like, okay, whatever gigs call, I'll do. Mm. I got called by a supermodel and um, her husband who, well, I mean, they were getting married, the fiance, I guess, at the time. And they're like, hey, can you play our wedding? I'm like, I I don't do weddings, man. What are you talking about? And they're like, okay, no, you get to do you, do whatever the heck you want, whatever, whatever. And I get there and it's at this fancy spot. Um, Her husband was the guy who made those electric scooters. He's Mm -hmm. the CEO of that company. And then she's a supermodel, you know, swimsuit edition, uh, Sports Illustrated model. Super cool people, the whole nine. Very much that trope, though, like the the older rich guy, the younger hot model, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, And I show up and I brought my rig. Everything's cool. And the first four and a half hours of this, like, (laughs) five and a half hour gig, I'm literally, I literally just play, like, Sinatra stuff. And I'm literally just playing like co- cocktail hour tunes. music. Yeah. Cocktail. Yeah. I was like, okay, <laughs> what the hell? And then the whole last hour, they just went completely nuts and like, yeah. And then we turned up and then I did my normal, you know, crazy set. Everyone's jumping, you know, nice. screaming and all that stuff. But that first four and a half hours, man, I'm like, <laughs> I'm getting paid a lot of money to be here. Whatever, man. Yeah. <laughs> so it depends on how much it pays. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you when you came up with the name Drumageddon. And then you decided to spell it the way you do for people who have no idea who you are or, or aren't watching this. How many people have mispronounced the spelling of drum again? Because I I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. When when we were talking to Eileen, she gave us a list of guests a while back. I'm like, oh, drama getting. Like, I wonder what he's about. And then I'm like, oh, huh. it's drama getting. How many people have butchered your 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 stage name? Oh, I saw a lot of fans coming up to me today. Yeah. Is it Dr. Magnet? Dr. <laughs> Magnet. <I'm> like, <laughs> Dude, man. That's my evil villain name. That's what I check in the hotels. Yeah. I'm yeah. Dr. Magnet. You know? yeah. But I got drums Mageddon, drum apocalypse. Oh, drums I've Mageddon got, is um, pretty good. Yeah, mm. which is freaking hilarious. <laughs> no, I mean the idea was that uh Skrillex, uh, my nephew introduced me to Skrillex like years and years ago when he was sure. first getting you know to be big um and i was like yo this music is louder and more intense than any metal like the heaviest death metal i've ever played like this crap is so loud and so intense so i was like all right let me get in there and i'll try to do stuff of my own in that vein and then skrillex has a weird looking name you know a lot of these guys have the weird you know name so i was like drumageddon d-r-m-a-g-d-n you know so easy (laughs) Just do it like that. Smush it. It looks better on a poster when there's less letters. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. 
the end. <laughs> now, now you've gone on to make a, a whole bunch of very popular remixes. I, I don't know if it was the last one was the the Beatles um, one that you did and whatnot. Um, give us a little insight into into those creations, or like how you go about picking and choosing your projects and your um kind of like your your writing style or or how you go about like okay this is the thing i'm going to work on and what to release because you almost have like two different things you have this very this live performance thing you do but then you also are are writing and producing things that may or may not match what you're doing live but like what um what is your process with that how you pick and choose i mean the process with tunes so when it comes to originals, number one, I mean, I basically start with either a really good hook idea, you know, like a melodic line that people can sing along to for a synth sure. or just a lyric that's really, really dope, you know, and I'll try to build out a song. And the minute that I get a vibe and a feel, you know, it, everything I do is EDM pop. EDM stands for electronic dance music. So you're talking like Steve Aoki, Calvin Harris, David Guetta, right. um, Zed, those guys doing that kind of stuff. That's that's what I do, basically. Um, so putting everything through that filter, you know, all my originals have, you know, different, different vibes of like... Um, Wake Me Up by Avicii, that's a great tune that a lot of people know. I have a song called Not Alone that got picked up by um, American American Songwriter Magazine, right? Ooh. And that was an honor. It was me, Niall Rogers above me, and right below me, Alan Jackson. And, you know, this is, <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is a magazine that, like, <laughs> writes about, you know, the Beatles and Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen, and it's me screaming, you know, ah, in yeah. between these two. Mm, Alan Jackson and Dr. Mageddon on the yeah, same Dr. Cover, Magnum, you know? man, for a year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Mageddon in England, you know. No, the, uh, <laughs> but no, so like writing the original tunes, um, having a knack for, you know, lyrics and the whole thing, that was one way that I, I went. And the other way is taking tunes that people might not know or forgotten, like my favorite Beatles song of all time is Something. And Something by the Beatles, George Harrison wrote it. Um, great Beatle, one of the four Beatles, obviously, but one of my favorite Beatles. He's one of the top four, for sure. He's yeah. one of the top four Beatles. Peter Best time. didn't make the mark, sorry. Yeah, not not quite, not quite. <laughs> and uh, But yeah, like he he's doing his thing. And, uh, you know, Paul and John wouldn't really let him do that sure. much in the Beatles. It wasn't until, like, the Beatles were starting to break up that he was able to get his songs in. Something is one of them. Mm-hmm. Great tune, ballad, very chill. Um, I was like, you know what? No one's really done this before. I get signed to BMG Records, which is major label, and uh, they just acquired his entire catalog. That was leading me to my next question: How it's you like, go about this? Holy yeah. crap, man! Right. You, you guys have the catalog. It's like, yeah, you want to do want to do a song with? Yeah, go for it. It's like, all right. I showed them the demo. Like, oh, this is great, man! Great vocal, the whole nine. You know, I mocked it up, and then I finished it. Um, basically, I'm friends with American Idol singers, the voice singers, because I played in their projects, I produced them, you know, music directed them, whatever. Um, friends with them for years, so I just throw on a different, hey, you'd be good on this one. Um, I called up Michelle Ray from The Voice. She lives in LA now. We met in New York City and worked together there. Um, she's like, oh, this is freaking great. So she jumped on it. And then on all my tunes, you know, I just mock up the whole rest of the thing. I, re- you know, track everything myself on keyboard and synth and all that right. stuff. And if I feel like putting any live instruments on, I mean, obviously drums I, I can handle and I have all the gear. Yeah, that'd but, be really um, funny if you just hire drummers. Yeah, just hire drummers. <laughs> I don't even drum, man. <laughs> Ghost drumming my stuff now. But, uh, you know, some of my friends have won Grammys playing on uh, Viva La Vida Coldplay. I have the string section from that. I have um, the horns from All the Lights, Kanye and Rihanna. Like they're all on the track and they've won Grammys and everything. So I have a full orchestra and it literally was me just programming everything, sending them the score, having them track and send me the tracks back. And then I just layered it on top of what I did. So it came out really, really dope. Um, And I actually put together the cover. I was, uh, I live in the village in the West village in New York and I got a really good for, you know, friend photographer of mine, Manish Gosalia, and we actually sat up and went oh, cool. to my street. Nice. And that's, oh, just, very that's cool. the street I live in yeah. at Seventh Ave. And then I just basically dress differently <laughs> in each one. I love that. That's a good my idea. shoes are off right here, and I have yeah. unbelievable disease from that, I'm sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> my feet on the pavement in New York. 
You know, yeah. in the back, that's Ringo's kit that he used at the um, at Ed Sullivan Theater, the yep. uh, start of Beatlemania. You know, those big Super TV cool. shows yeah. that they did yeah. initially. And then I went to all the um, all the individual places that the Beatles went to the very first time they came, and I filmed the music video there. So I basically went oh, cool. back, showed the date and mm. the times and all that, and it's on YouTube. It came out really, really dope. So. I, you mm-hmm. kind of segue to a question I did want to ask you, and I think it's kind of important too for like people listening who are who are into mixing and, and making their own music. As far as hey, I want to do something with this massive popular song or this hook, um, but you you said you know you got signed to the record label and they let you use it. How like for a DJ or or for anybody making electronic music, what are some of the hurdles with like getting through? copyright and things like that and being able to use that like how mu- how big of a problem or or um issue is it navigating through that oh it's the biggest pain in the ass normally yeah. so yeah. what happened is like i wouldn't have even touched especially the beatles yeah they're yeah. like yeah, you're not starting a, yeah, yeah. yeah they're notorious for like taking things down and you know basically having things that are I, they're very, very, they have one of the biggest, best catalogs of all time. So no sure. one could really touch them. That's one of the reasons why no one remixed something by the Beatles before and even touched it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when you're dealing with tunes, there's a bunch of different ways to go. If you just do a basic cover that you just, you know, if you're a singer songwriter, you can basically just get a short license on Harry Fox. You go to harryfox.com. You buy a license for X amount of, you know, viral YouTube plays. Okay, just buy a thousand to start. And then, you know, you keep on re-upping if it gets into the millions. You're going to be paying a lot of money to actually do that tune if it does blow up. But that exposure, the idea is that it's going to outweigh itself, you know. Mm. Um, That's the way to actually have no issue, right? So if you just do a basic cover. Now, if you start to, you know, take the arrangement and do something different, change lyrics, use samples, whatever. Like I basically re-recorded the, um, the original Beatles tune from the ground up. Like I took all their parts and I re-recorded it. Mm -hmm. So I had full ownership and control over the, the recording itself. Right. And then had a girl sing it in a different key. So obviously she's a girl, so she's going to be a little higher. Um, had a girl sing it in a different key to flip the gender and kept the lyrics the same and everything. And, uh, you know, they actually put me into the, um, you know, BMG and everyone put me into the Grammy consideration, right? Um, But for the Grammy consideration for remix, they needed me to use George Harrison's original vocal. So I was like, oh, Um, if I would have known that, I would have done that. But I like having Michelle sing. It sounds insane. Like, George is a good singer and all, but like she's an actual singer. So it's like, Mm. and you know, for the next one though, I'm going to be sneaking out probably this year. um, Here comes the sun and do something really like gnarly nine inch nailsy, you know, dark with that tune. And I'll probably use George's vocal that I have, you know, from BMG. Um, But the hurdles are if you don't have a publishing company, a record label management, that's helping you track down stuff don't screw with the song too yeah. much right yeah. <laughs> you know otherwise mm. and then get your own you know rights through harry fox or something like that um and then you'll be okay but other than that i mean youtube here's the other trick is don't put it on all the dsps digital service providers like spotify um yeah. amazon music apple music they'll take you down if you do things up there but YouTube has a blanket license with all the record labels, so you can do covers uh-huh. on YouTube. You can yeah, also true. sneak them on TikTok, and generally they're okay. But uh, a buddy of mine actually started doing like remixes of Disney tunes as an R&B artist, and they kept on muting his audio. So what would happen is he'd have a video hit, you know, fifty million, five million on on TikTok, and the the sound would be muted by Disney. You know, so then there was no sound for anyone hmm. else to, you know, and he well, they need the money. On, so yeah. uh, uh, that's, you know what? <laughs> Disney Plus needs the money. <laughs> <laughs> with, Crazy. So with interesting. all the stuff that you've done, all the artists that you worked with, have you ever once been like starstruck by anybody you worked with or any project you've been on? 
Besides up, up right in, now. Up right? until this okay. interview, yeah. No, I was going to say, yeah, besides yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we understand what's going on here. Yeah, yeah obviously. Just yeah, take a yeah. breath. Just take mm-hmm. a breath. I'm yeah. trying to, you know, yeah. I, I you, get paid a lot of money to say that, right? And just, yeah. You know? <laughs> if you got to go back in the drums and get it out and come back. We'll, you know, we'll, I'll, be, I'll yeah. be back in uh, two yeah. hours, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm trying to think. You know what? I opened for Bon Jovi twice. And I wasn't starstruck, you know, I've been on the scene for years and years. The first time, um, was it, was it the first time, the second time? First time Richie Sambora was in rehab, so they had a session guy playing guitar. And that's cool, you know. Uh, But the drummer actually missed his flight. And I heard them at soundcheck. And... They don't have any rhythm when there's no drums. Oh, no. It was oh. like he can sing his ass off. His voice sounded amazing back then, like spot the hell on. And then he turns around, he looks at me. It's like because he saw I was a drummer. We were, you know, sound checking and everything. It's like, yeah, we need drums, man. And that should have been my cue. I was with a very territorial artist at that time who didn't want me, you know, doing other people's gigs. And I was music directing and we were opening for Bon Jovi in Puerto Rico, you know. So I was going to just jump up and just do sound check with him, but I didn't. Right. Um, but he wasn't, he, he was just there hanging out like, and then he immediately left, went to his private room with his private chef and didn't talk to anyone. When the drummer came, we both endorsed the same symbols, Pisces. Yeah. And uh, he was super cool. The uh, keyboard player is a session guy was super cool. Like that was a whole crew. Um, I wouldn't say starstruck. I mean, mm-hmm. I ran into uh, Ed Sheeran in LA at the Rainbow Room. I was hanging out with a bunch of people and I look over and I'm hanging out with like a paparazzi photographer friend of mine um, and a couple other people. And she goes, oh my God, it's Ed Sheeran. Yeah, you know, I'm friends with this bodyguard. It's like, oh yeah, I'm friends with this music director. You know, let's just go say hi. Ed Sheeran was completely plastered. He was out of it, you know, and all his <laughs> friends are British and hanging out. And he's like, I was like, hey man, how's it going? Man? It's like, I'm not Ed. I'm not Ed Sheeran. I'm not like, okay, dude. Okay. Uh, yeah. And his friends are like, dude, I'm so sorry. I know you guys work together with, you know, his musicians and stuff and whatever. But like, <laughs> so that guy was like out of it, man. But great talent. Um, trying to think of anyone else. Talia. I play with Talia, a big uh, Latin pop star and everything. Yep. Did a bunch of commercials with her. And she is literally at like Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston level in the Latin community. Right. You know, yeah. whenever I hang out with anyone, you know, who's Latino, I'm just like, hey, do you know Tully? Oh, my God. He's like, check it out. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. But um, she was really cool, really nice person, unbelievable voice, unbelievable singer. And not many people know because, you know, her whole show is on mm-hmm. on backing track, you know. Sure. Yeah, but um, I'm trying to. I, not really starstruck, but you know, just met a bunch of cool people in the industry, and most of them are actually really cool. So, and you worked with Soho Johnny, who was a former guest on the show. So, yes. Soho Johnny yeah. is a character, man. He's the best, you know. And shout out to Eileen and Jimmy for you know getting me on this and sure. and all the press and everything, man. Soho is great. We did uh, the big nine eleven benefit together in New York, and uh, came out really, really dope. We got on a like Times Square billboard side of New York buildings and. Cool. Really, really cool. Awesome. So. so, this has been great. First off, um, thank you for giving us a, a few minutes of your time. Um, if, if people want to go check you out or or see what's coming, I know you kind of just dropped you. You said that another Beatles cover is coming up, but what uh, should people look forward to in the world of uh, drum again in here? All right, so I got off a ten country world tour this past year, five countries the year before this year, we're trying to hit 25 countries. So awesome. definitely check Ooh. me out on all those socials at Drumageddon, D-R-M-A-G-D-N. That's everywhere. That's Spotify, that's YouTube, that's Instagram, that's TikTok, that's Apple Music, Amazon, all that Drumageddon, D-R-M-A-G-D-N. And uh, basically touring a lot this year, I already have Finland booked. I have um, Maine and Maryland that are looking at, you know, booking me there. Um, but building out a Europe tour, building out a U.S. tour, and then trying to get to Asia this year, which would be dope. Um, doing a bunch of remixes and originals this year also. So make sure, you know, you get on that Spotify, you click follow, um, which would include, you know, Here Comes the Sun, George Harrison, Beatles. Um, I actually, I'll, I'll tell you guys this. This is on the DL completely, but I'll, right. I'll tell you guys first. Right. But uh, I was passing the ice cream truck. 
right? In New York, it was around for, it's freezing. It's, you know, below, you know, mm-hmm. unbelievable cold out right now. And uh, I heard the tune. I was like, yo, this tune is actually a jam. No do, one's ever do, remixed do, the do, ice cream do, truck do, tune. Do, 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 do. Yes. That one? <laughs> no okay. one ever remixed the ice cream truck theme. I remix it. I sent oh, it to the label go. like, yo, this is insane. Yes. So I have it, <laughs> and I'm trying to get a couple guests on it so it's not just me. Mm. You know, I'm, try- I'm trying to talk to someone like Steve Aoki and all that. So no, you need one of the ices, yeah. like Ice Cube or mm. Ice Cube. Oh, my God. You're or, right. Um, Those would go together nicely. Ice Ice Cube and Ice Ice Spice. You need one of these yeah. people on there. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. You know what? That's the remix done. You yeah, know? there you go. Yeah, but just remember be... us. Just remember us when it comes uh-huh. out and it blows up. No. <laughs> so that's going to be that's the summer, and then uh, no one's ever remixed the Nutcracker Suite. So nice. I have an entire EDM remix of the Nutcracker Suite. Oh, cool! I filmed a bunch of the content and all the the music videos like during this holiday season, oh, awesome. and then you know that's cool. going to be coming out this year too. So those two things definitely look for it um tons of originals coming collaborations with different artists and people too so it's going to be dope awesome vanilla Um, ice would be another great one (laughs) there you go uh final question for me how long does it take to get those sweet spikes on your head uh set up is that like a multi-hour situation going or what oh no 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 this is this is only five minutes max you know it's like (laughs) It's a glue. It's basically it's waterproof because I sweat like a monster and the whole thing. <laughs> but when fans ask me, when fans ask me how I get my mohawk to go up and everything, I just say it's made from the tears of my enemies. So that's it. Just collect oh. them over time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, drum again, and this has been fantastic. We wish you luck with everything you got going on. Uh, it's cool to see someone who used to live local up, up the street uh become a, uh something special and doing what you do so thank you for joining us and and good luck in the future man thank you guys rock and roll drum uh get it mike uh Ooh. it's cool to see jersey guys especially like he he where he went to school is literally two miles away from my house so uh, yeah, why didn't if you were that close? Why didn't that talent rub off to you, Scotty? Out of curiosity. Well, you know what? Um, I like to be like more of a background guy. I'm mm-hmm. not like on camera guy. I just kind of like to give the talent to the local guys. You know. So your background. I don't like to it. shine. Background to get in. That's your name. Gotcha. Yeah, background to get in. Yeah, that really flows off the tongue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's excited. Where's he? Yeah, where's it? It's like a Where's Waldo game. It's like I found background again. And well, oh, what's that behind the drummer? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. Imagine being a local musician and then suddenly having um, the Beatles catalog at your fingertips. Uh, pretty, pretty cool story. So, um, back to we we brought up the Taylor Swift thing. Um, you asked me how many. I I said over. But the, the, it's amazing how in this country now that if if you are in um, if you are an enemy in the United States, why would you fight war where you could just hire thousands and thousands of trolls to get people to argue online and just tear the country apart from the inside? Right? We have literally pol- politicized. A musician being at a sporting event supporting her boyfriend or boyfriend. whatever, enjoying her boyfriend. The girl who just sold <laughs> bazillions of tickets um, in like the largest world tour of all time broke Ticketmaster. This is what I say to people. You're upset they're showing Taylor Swift. If in the 80s, Michael Jackson was in the, the box, he would be shown... 3,000 times. Uh, shit. I mean, if Kim Kardashian and Kanye West were there, whatever, during their big years, they would have been shown all the time. Okay? If some... If Madonna... If Madonna was dating uh, Joe Montana, he she would have been shown every two seconds. Um, this is the if same- somebody saw Janet Jackson's boob during that one Super Bowl and, like, I got to get that... Yeah. And they came back next year with her, they would be talking about her. Yeah. So it's just like it's such now now here's the thing I would throw at you. Like the average football fan who's complaining about it 
if Ric Flair was shown on the camera every eight hmm. seconds, they would love every single minute of it. Oh, my God. <laughs> they would just absolutely love it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, Eminem, they showed him a ton of times in the three Detroit games and all, not one. Burn! What yeah. are you doing there? So you're telling me you're upset by a national broadcast yeah. showing the biggest person in the country right now as far as pop icons. Why would they not? Why would they not show her? They show her for eight seconds cheering, and people are losing their minds about this. Hell, she got outstaged by the guy's brother being shirtless in Buffalo. We all talked about exactly. Travis Kelsey's brother more than anything. I mean, like, yeah, does, it, it just... does it bother you in any way? Because I feel well, like I, I'm the it... minority. People are like, oh, you're doing I'm like, who cares? Good for her. Yeah, let's go down the list. Is she like going on social media and like, oh, this is so cute, blah, 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 about the game? No. Is she doing interviews at the game? No. Is she, is there rumors that she's secretly telling Travis to put this cute play I thought of in the Super Bowl? No. She's no. literally there cheering. She's sitting there with the family of the, the guy and she goes off and does her business. You hear, Nothing from her before, during, or after. Yeah, is she All sitting the there with a big, uh, real like Trump or Biden sign? Like, like is she passing any political yeah. views or negative views on the game or making mm. it about her? I mean, shit, that whole Joe Coy thing. She he made a little corny joke about her being seen on football, and she was like furious about it. It seems like she doesn't. I don't know. Maybe she wants to be seen, sure, but mm. seems like this is not her thing. She knows mm. that same arena that she's watching games in sold out tomorrow if she announced the show that day. Football is is petty to her at this yeah. point. I, I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, if you're sick of seeing Taylor Swift, I would love to go see the Super Bowl. So if you will pay the probably six figure costs for to get Burlu in the box. I guarantee I will block her at every moment humanly possible during the game. Every time there's a pass to Travis Kelsey, I am just gonna I'm gonna make sure I have a coat to have more range. You will never see Taylor Swift at any point during the Super Bowl, thanks to me. And all I ask for is that six figure ticket. Oh, and uh, accommodations and food in uh, Las Vegas. So just visit burlublocker.com. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that, that works for anybody. You know, you're sick of seeing your grandparents during Thanksgiving. I will come over, have a turkey dinner, and just land on top of the table in front of them for you. <laughs> You'll lay on the turkey? No. Yeah, I mean, we'll make space. I mean, I'll come over to the house, and they're like, you're adorable, and all. you're going to be the centerpiece of this table. Yeah, I mean, it's just a sad, it, it's such a sad time in this country, man. Like, it's socially, it's just, Everybody is complaining about everything. It doesn't matter what it is. So the super pop star dates the super popular NFL guy. Shocking. Maybe they actually get along and like this is like what they want to do. Like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like why does it bother anyone? Like uh, uh, of according to all accounts, like Taylor Swift is really good to her employees. It's charitable and. Just actually plays instruments at her concerts. I mean, yeah, maybe it's not your music, but who cares? As long as she doesn't spoil the Deadpool 3 trailer, I'm fine. I want to see that thing clean, okay? Yep. I mean, if anything, else. like I guess it's kind of cool. Like, like younger audiences that might not watch football who are into her might tune in. I don't know. Like, you're mm -hmm. like, oh, and ironically, <clears throat> a lot of the people let's say of their they're in the right persuasion uh, mm. they may lean toward a certain side of the political mm. aisle who are also usually like um uh, very capitalist people right yeah. very much about capitalism who so may be angry with the chiefs but they love the color red yeah but you're blaming the NFL for capitalizing on the biggest celebrity in the world and making more money and getting more eyes on that mm. seems a little ironic uh, mm. to me and then on top, I think this Super Bowl is going to be on Nickelodeon this year. 
<laughs> is it really? Do they have broadcast? Well, well, CBS has got it, and they own <laughs> Nickelodeon. Also, we're going to have SpongeBob on there, like explain football to everybody. I guess I will say I put on the um, the NFL broadcast where they did it from Andy's room, from the mm-hmm. Toy Story room, and it was pretty cool. How they did it. They it looked like bobbleheads running around, but they had must have had something on all the players where it looked like um, they were playing in Andy's room live. And hey, my three year old son watched it for about fifteen minutes, and that might not sound like a lot. That's a, that was a huge uh, expenditure of his time into sports. I I kind of like the one. I think it was like two years ago, the Saints were beating the Bears. It was like twenty to three with like two seconds left. And the Bears score a touchdown, and they're still putting up the animation with like <laughs> slime going out. He's the slime time player of the game. I mean, I'm so- sure some redneck that said he was going to never watch football again is going to be watching football again oh, and yeah. complain about the Nickelodeon broadcast. I don't recall those uh, those ratings dropping when that whole we ain't watching football again happened. It's just unbelievable. Like, this is just old people. Like, to bring this podcast full circle, this is just people who are older not being able to let go of that, like, they have to bring new people into sports. Like, in order for your sport to go on and be the sport you loved with Grandpa, I watched it as a kid, there was no Taylor Swift there. <laughs> like, it has to go on, and it has to get new fans, and it has to, you know, evolve. It's okay, guys. The game of football is still going on. Back in my day, my players got concussions, and they went back in there and lost their memory, but we were happy. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, Mike, what else you got before we go? Whatever. All right. So right before the holidays, um, I got weird, like, 24-hour bug going. I, uh, it was one of those things where I couldn't regulate my uh, body temperature no. at all. So I, I was taking, like, three or four baths and, like, boiling hot water just to get myself to regular temperature. And I got, like, super tired. But I got yeah, maybe because brain- you were taking three or four boiling baths and you were tired. Like I mean, the brain was a little soft after I did it. But the, the way you say that, you're like, I couldn't regulate my temper. Like normally, you're just thinking about like ninety eight point six, ninety eight point. Like you're just wait so a minute, ninety seven point yeah. eight. That's not good. <laughs> you get back up there, young man. Like that, you just mentally always <laughs> regulate your temperature. Yeah. I'm like, like Dennis one, Reynolds. One day I, you're, just, yeah, exactly. One day you're just like, I can't do it. Like I just feel <laughs> off. Yeah, we we gotta have a meeting, body. This has been going off for too long. So you probably are the guy. That, you you probably have to think about breathing too, right? You're like, okay, inhale, exhale, inhale. Like you have to really focus. Wait, on what's it. the order? No, oh, I've been exhaling for the last hour. No wonder I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah, you've been exhaling for ten years on this show. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. So I was getting like. I was having the shakes. I was super tired. So I'm trying to like sleep it off. And I don't know how to describe it. I, I wouldn't call it. I, I guess the closest thing I could say was my brain was somewhat hallucinating uh-huh. in the I'll sense that, there. yeah, yeah, where I kept convincing myself for some reason that I had to figure out a a work database before I could go to sleep. The whole database, you had to just yeah. figure it out. Yep. Yeah, let me preface by, I do work in tech. I don't work with databases. I probably haven't done anything in databases since like college or something like that. Uh-huh. But somewhere in my brain, I convinced myself that work needed me to fix this problem. Now, and I kept on going in my head and I'm like, all right, table, blah, 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 and join. All right, I did that part, uh, but I can't join that table to that table. Meanwhile, when I'm saying, like, my brain's going through this, I'm not using, like, actual factual tables or actual commands, but my brain kept on convincing me I was trying to figure this out, and it kept reminding me, nope, I can't go to sleep until I figure out this table. So you turn into some kind of, like, cyborg computer where you were just building the database in your eyeballs. Yeah, um, I had to convince myself I had to 
join these certain things and fix this problem before I can go to sleep. And it, I, I kid you not, like I'd be under like five covers, I'm shaking. I'm like, All right, I'm about to go to sleep. I'm going to sleep. Wait a minute, if I do that join command, that's not going to factor in that. Oh God, I got to start. And I literally could not sleep for four hours, even though I was exhausted beyond words because my brain convinced myself of this. Now, I have been in this position before. In fact, like I'm such a bad sleeper that these manic thoughts, not manic, manic thoughts isn't the right word, but these meaningless thoughts roam through my head where I can't shut them off and I can't get to sleep. I, sw- I think I've told you this on the podcast before. It's happened multiple times. I am not a wrestling fan since 1998 or whatever the hell it was. Mm-hmm. I will think of wrestling moves like if as if I have to come up with one, like a new one, over and over and over again. And I, it, I swear to God, I just cycle through moves in my head like, what would I do? What would I do? Oh, that's not original. That's not original. That's been done. That's not, or that's not possible. And this thought enters my head while I'm trying to go to sleep over and over and over again. And I can't figure it out. Like for some reason, I can't quite touch it or, or, or figure it out. And it's just like this fluttering screen in front of me. Like, so I, you literally like in your head, oh my God, the Royal Rumble is this Saturday. And if I'm in there with Kofi Kingston, I gotta, I gotta make sure I gotta move to jive him in some way. Here's the thing: I don't even know who Kofi Kingston is, but I would definitely finish him with my finisher that has been apparently in development for years. When I try to go to sleep, that I just don't know what it is, and it's the most random thought. I wake yeah. up in the morning, like after I finally do go to sleep, and I'm like, "Why is your brain?" doing this like it doesn't have any connection to yourself anymore there is nothing that i'm not watching wrestling yeah most i watch wrestling is uh, old clips that pop up on facebook like some reason scott at 10 30 11 o'clock at night needs to have a finishing move yeah to finally get over the hump to go to sleep like you're about to sleep and then you just realize you're in the middle of the ring with kofi kingston and Jerry Lawler's like, what's he going to do? Yeah, like, there it is. Like, the, the the Irish jackhammer or something. Like, it has to have, like, a name. And this, I have crazy, like, lucid thoughts. I don't know what you call them. Literally last night, it's funny you bring this up. I had a sex dream last night. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, and it was actually with my wife, which is, you know. Damn it! You know why? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it it wasn't just sex. We were having sex on a sailboat. Oh, okay. Like, not like a big like yacht sailboat, like one of those little sunfish sailboats. <laughs> was it just a sail and the little like one thing. of those ones you rent for like yeah. thirty dollars for <laughs> <Yep>. an hour? <laughs> yep. We were going at it. On a sailboat. And I literally woke up this morning. She woke up a little after me. We're talking. I'm like, I got, I had a dream I had to tell you about. I had a sex dream. She's like, oh, yeah, really? I'm like, yeah. And then she's like, you know, she just the look she gives me after I tell her, yeah, we were on a sailboat. She's like, you're a psycho killer. Like, why are you thinking these things? Like, I feel like my wife goes to sleep. Her brain just turns off. It's done. Mm-hmm. Me, I'm thinking about wrestling moves mm-hmm. and sex on a sailboat, which is probably exactly what Vince McMahon dreams of. <laughs> now, Scott, your polar bear plunge is coming up. It, it is. So so you realize you can take care of that fantasy right then and there. It's like after you start swimming in the ice-cold Atlantic Ocean, you come out on the sand just glistening, uh-huh. and then you're just, you just stare at your wife, and you just point at a sailboat and you're like now yeah is there anything more romantic than a shivering (laughs) a shivering cold (laughs) irish man yeah a shivering (laughs) pale man on a sailboat in 30 degree weather (laughs) just having coitus i i'm sure there's some like vikings who find that very erotic i would assume yeah i um i don't know what's wrong with me when I go to sleep. I, I I try to figure it out all the time. Like, why can't what is causing this like 
anxiety or these these thoughts that are just like the only way I could describe it, it's like a flashing TV screen where it's not quite full like mm. footage, but it's just like like blips of things that are going on. So in your brain, it's like you accidentally hit the favorite channel button and the TV is just going to random channels and then you have to address what's ever on the TV. That's not a bad description, actually. That's kind of what mm. is going on. So yeah. it's like I can go to sleep, but the weather channel is talking about the hail in Madagascar. But here's the thing. I, I have a windsurfer somewhere. I don't use it. I don't want a sailboat, nor mm-hmm. do I have any fantasy in my life of having sex in a sailboat. Mm-hmm. So there is no like reason this would be a thing that I'm like, you know, they say your dreams are like, you know, the the genesis of like things that you actually want or you're thinking about. I've never thought about this in my entire life, but yet here I am doing finishing moves and uh you know, sailing the seas. Yeah, Scott, the brain wants what it wants. So I'll, one of these years, I'm going to hook you up, and I'm going to send you Are some you? Like cash. I'm going to my birthday make sure, coming up. Yeah, 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 coming. Yeah, yeah, like I'm going to make sure like the kids are like being taken care of by family members, something <laughs> like that. I'm going <laughs> to make sure you have a nice romantic right, right. dinner, right. and then just be like it's your walk in the beach of Atlantic mm-hmm. City, mm-hmm. and you just. Look out in the ocean. It's like, oh, th- there's a sun dancer. Care to come with me? Yeah. And just yeah. one, you think I'm going to walk the beach in Atlantic City? Um, if you've ever yeah. been there, like, I will probably step on a heroin needle at some point. Well, that will advance. I mean, maybe one of them has like Viagra in the the sure. syringe. So, I mean, th- that that just adds to it. It's like, ow. Oh. Can you imagine trying to stay focused in that act while also like tacking and and, and like guiding the wind to keep yeah. your boat going straight? Like like after you're finished, you will have to call the Coast Guard. You will be like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Sure. I got to be honest with you. I'm sure something with the tides that you will be like three knots out to sea, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Imagine that Coast Guard call. Uh, you know, uh, we have a, uh, a sexy sailboat situation going on here. Again! <laughs> Bring in the helicopter. Uh, we'll get out of there. Uh, is it the shivering Irishman again? Yeah. He's been uh, here so many times. I hope he doesn't give me his finishing move on the way up. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you... Stop grabbing me! <laughs> did you... Um, did you come to terms with your thing, or did you just eventually give up? It was literally four hours of it hitting my brain, me literally in my brain, screaming to my brain, you don't do this work. There's, n- You don't even know tables. Stop it. Shivering, about to go to sleep, happening again. And then after four hours, I just said enough and then just lucked out and actually shut off. I love that it took you four hours to say enough. You're like, okay, I think we've reached our limit here. <laughs> All right, I looked at that table plenty <laughs> enough time, boys. We can save this for Monday, okay? The best part of this dream is that you had to call a imaginary IT guy to do the IT job that you were trying to do yeah. in your head. The IT job that I am apparently supposed to do, but I don't do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well... I'm glad you. I'm glad you made it out of the uh, the matrix, if you will. But uh, yeah, it was an inception in my brain. Apparently, there's a company. I think it's in Japan. I just saw it the other day that has. There are out, companies in Japan. That is correct, Scott. Um, has figured out how to record your dreams, and that is absolutely frightening. Would there you want? No way. Would you want your dreams? There's no way there would people. be like valid dreams where it's like, well, that's interesting right there. No Can you way. Imagine how many like divorces that would cause. Like, oh my God. Like, and you'd be like, like I was dreaming. I was dreaming. Yeah. You know, it wasn't real. My wife has been mad at me because of a dream she's had. Mm-hmm. She's woken up and be like, you did this in my dream. Can you imagine like your actual dreams, which you have no control of, being broadcasted? Oh my god! Oh, just, no possible. Just me doing finishing moves and like being on a <laughs> sailboat with someone that's not her. She would be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> my God, the Irish jackhammer! My God, Jane! 
Irish Jackhammer is not a bad name for a finishing move, but you know, maybe no. maybe tonight when I go to sleep, oh, it'll finally settle. No, you know tonight, like you're gonna be like Burlu, I haven't slept in four days because of this conversation. <laughs> My brain's been going through the roller deck of what the Irish Jackhammer could be. What uh, is it? What is it? Like, like maybe he can land in potatoes? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. The brain's brain is a very interesting thing. That's why I don't use it too much. Nope. Oh, that brings us to the end of the cast. Uh, feels good to actually talk for once. Um, it's good to stop this thing before 11 o'clock for once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike, anything to promote before we roll? Uh, I'm going to promote our friend KP Burke. Uh, his podcast oh, is American Loser. Yeah. Uh, he, him and his dad do podcasts on the the, the quote-unquote losers of American history. It's it's very, uh, very infomercial, if you will. It, it will, you'll say, <laughs> yeah, I, as you can tell, I had no idea yeah. where I was going to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Th- this is the best. Uh, Con- th- 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 no, 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 we're no, not cutting no. anything. Yeah, we're going to uh, cut. We're gonna uh, cut. Okay. His podcast is very infomercial E. <laughs> so he's selling you a product for four hours a night. Um, well, it's very awesome. If yeah. Mike did some research, <laughs> the America's Loser podcast is not actually going at the moment. They're doing YouTube videos and yeah. changing their format. And I was going to I, congratulate him. Also, I saw he got got interviewed on Newsmax recently about his podcast. So was that's it why infomercially? I, um, I, I don't have Newsmax, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> no, but seriously, go check out. KP's doing good stuff. He's got some plans for the show, apparently, that are... Yeah, not released yet, but he has a very good idea. And the past episodes of American Loser podcast are very good. In fact, uh, I was on one of them about Nicholas uh, Nikolai Tesla. So um, yeah, go check them out. Not Nikolai and, Volkov. That would be a good one. He, was he an American loser? I don't know. He did lose to Hogan. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, he was a jabroni. <laughs> all the time i will quickly uh promote in a couple weeks i'm going into the atlantic ocean um Ooh. we are doing the polar bear plunge once again there's about 10 12 of us going in um it's a great fundraiser for special olympics um it, it is a very uh transparent um charity for special olympics and it means a lot to me and my family so if you want to go donate go to polar plunge nj.com org i believe it is um if not if you want to donate to our team go to the frozen clovers um that is frozen clovers and donate so other than that guys we are getting out of here we got some good stuff coming up we got some long interviews coming up and uh hey we'll be here though too so uh i want to thank drum drum again for coming on other than that guys life is funny laugh at it keep the wind at your dick Blocker Burl's ready for Swifty.